cheap, right? I've heard one. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I would like uh, everyone to be seated, please. Thank you. Okay. Once again, good morning and uh, uh, good to see a lot of people here. And uh, my name is Aftab Siddiqui. And just a small disclaimer. I'm standing here as a member of the community uh, and we will be discussing about uh, and the IP4 market space, how it's going, how it is working. Well, we can't get rid of IP4, right? Can't we? Anyway, so let's talk about this. Um, we have a great panel here um, and I would like to invite uh, Mr. George Q from AP Nick member services to give his thoughts about it. All right, good morning all. Um, I'm George Kuo from APNIC. Um, I'd like to talk to you about IPv4 uh, market transfer this morning. Basically, there are three parts in my talk. I'm firstly going to take a quick look at what's in the transfer with our APNIC policies, what the conditions are and activities since the implementation of the policy. And also followed by that, looking at the processes involved in terms of transfer within this region and transfer between the APNIC region and other IR regions. And finally, just going through what are uh, like a checklist or what the preparation is needed uh, to do your transfer. So, in other words, I hope by the end of the presentation, you have a better understanding of what's involved on the policy side and knowing what to look out for uh, when you have better understanding, a full view of the processes and then being able to do what is needed to do your transfer. And most important uh, of all, um, if you do need help or assistant, you, assistance, then you know where to get it. So we all know that there are different ways that people can transfer um, IPv4. And with the last edition of this uh, market transfer, the policy was first introduced uh, in 2010, where it defines the transfer just within the APNIC regions for IPv4 transfer. The year after that, the following year, 2011, the inter area transfer policy was then implemented. And subsequently, late in the year, the same year, a small addition to the pol transfer policy to add a requirement for the recipient uh, parties to provide the justification for the needs for the addresses. So this is what the policy um, <coughs> says for uh, transferring IPv4 addresses from or to or from a network for the IP address that's not in use. So <coughs> in the early days of the policy uh, implementation around 2010, you see very little or almost no transfer activities. And only until around 2013, you started to see the growth of the transfer activity. And a year later, there's more with inter IR transfers. So you might wonder who are behind these transfers, who are actually taking part in these transfers. The policy defines that, that for the transfer between the region, within, I'm talking about the APNIC region, it has to be coming from a current member account to the other current and valid member account. And the transfer between this region to the other IR regions, it works the same. It has to be between a current APNIC account and the account of the other IR that has the policy that allows transfer in and out of their region. Then what happened to the IPv4 addresses? What does the policy say? There are some condition sets for these addresses. Uh, has to be a minimum size of a slash 24, 
You can't say, well, I only need about 200 addresses or 100 addresses, so I will transfer that. It also <coughs> says that the address space that will be transferred uh, will have to be currently registered to a current account. So you need to be aware that it's uh, where the source is coming from has an account, a valid account with APNIC. And an address, um, addresses um, cannot be associated with any potential or a dispute uh, with the custodianship. All addresses are subject to the policy framework from the time of the, uh, the transfer. And again, mentioned it earlier, recipient must provide the justification for the IP address space they are receiving. Let's take a look, a quick look at the flow. So you will have a uh, might put everything in the context for you. So this starts, the actual transfer starts from the source to initiate the transfer, and the recipient will acknowledge that, and then the resources will get sent to APNIC for evaluation. So we take a look, the, uh, check um, the information that's provided, and if it's approved, then the recipient is notified uh, for payment, and then we will register the space, and then give it to the recipient. So now this is a high level of the process. Uh, I do have a URL at the end of my slide where you can look at all the details. Other, obviously, there are small steps involved, such as uh, <coughs> exchanging information if there's not enough uh, provided, and the notification, and so on. So what should a recipient do to prepare for the transfer? Uh, we would suggest that you will start by preparing the information that's needed as required by the policy, such as the 24 months plan for how you will use the address space in the future, and the information on how you have used this uh, IPv4 that you have, and if they're used according to the policies. And once you've got all that, then the next step is for you to send it to APNIC for approval, and this is what also known as the pre-approval. You get it approved before you do everything, so you kind of have a peace of mind knowing that it's approved. And then you go out and look for the sources to transfer, and we provide a listing service where you could have the pre-approval published onto the uh, APNIC website, and an objective that is so that the, the people who has a V4 to transfer will be able to uh, reach you via APNIC so you get their contact, but it's totally up to the recipient uh, whether they want to reach out um, to the offer or the source. <clears throat> Another avenue for you to be able to discuss and talk about a transfer will be subscribing to the APNIC um, transfer uh, mailing list. They might be useful. And of course, if you wish to engage a broker to help you with your transfer, that's all totally, totally up to your um, a choice. So once you've got the, um, the source to transfer, then always the recommendation is to get them to initiate the transfer process. So how is that done? So for the source um, that's going to be transferred within the region, obviously it's one of the APNIC current member account, they would log into my APNIC to use the transfer form. So all they need to do is they will need to find out the account name of the recipient, making sure it goes to the right um, recipient, goes to the right account, and then we'll check the range carefully, making sure you only uh, transfer the right uh, range, uh, no more or no less. And once that's done, it will trigger a notification to the recipient. Now the recipient, once they get it, they will acknowledge that, and complete the form, the rest of the form, and get it sent to APNIC. Now, the, the, the pre-approval that I mentioned uh, earlier, if you have got that done before, then all you do now is you accept that and get sent to APNIC without having to provide additional information in that process. What happens if you wanted to do an inter IR transfer? It's pretty much similar, and we're looking at from the source uh, in APNIC region's perspective. Again, always the source to initiate, 
get everything ready, sent it through to, my, uh, to APNIC for um, validating the information and evaluation. And if that's approved, then we would forward information to other IAR for further evaluation. And once it's all done, oh, okay, then we would inform um, the source party to make payments and then would transfer um, the IPv4 space to the other RIRs. So, to submit such transfer, obviously the source would have to identify the account name, the right name for the recipient, check the range carefully. Now, in this particular case, you don't actually use my PNIC because the other account is actually with the other IR region. So all you do is to use a um, short text form, which the URL is also provided with this um, pre um, presentation at the end, that you'll be able to look that up and you complete that text form and email it to admin at apnic.net. If you are the recipient of the inter IR transfer in APNIC region, again, as the policy says, you need to provide justification for your needs. And if you have done that in the pre-approval, then in its process, it's easy. You just wait. I mentioned um, earlier in the flow diagram where there's a transfer fee that needs to be paid. Um, so exactly who are paying those fees? Now, there's two categories here for the transfer between two parties within APNIC region the recipient will pay for the APNIC transfer fee. For inter area transfer, the account in APNIC region, it can be a source or can be a recipient, and that APNIC account will pay for the transfer fee. How much do you pay? <coughs> it's simple. Fees is charged in Australian dollar, and there's a calculator here to help you. So what you need to do is to put in the calculator how much address that will be involved, total address space involved in your transfer. Put it in, it will calculate the annual membership of the size of V4, and you take 20% of that amount, and that is what you need to for that particular transfer. And just be mindful that because you're adding more address space, receiving it into your accounts, uh, you, your next membership renewal may be affected because you're getting more addresses. Um, what are other things? We often ask, you know, what happened to my transfer? You know, where is it? Um, we identified the three things that I'm sharing with you. Um, a delay can happen sometimes because of payment, it, because it involves different banks, um, the, um, the amount of money that's been uh, transferred across, and so on. So it might take longer than uh, you expect. And until we receive the payment, uh, APNIC is not able to further process uh, the transfer. And often we also see that in the transfer request, there's not enough information uh, or documentation provided. So there is a to and back uh, you know, the process in, in having to seek that uh, more uh, information to be given and then you have to prepare for it. So that might take a little bit of time. And we all know everyone is busy going on with their business and sometimes the, um, the recipient um, might just take a little bit longer to respond, so um, that could be a, um, a one of the reasons um, that uh, might kind of make the transfer process go longer. But regardless, um, I would recommend that uh, you, the party, should talk to each other first um, to find out what has happened, and if there's a need, then of course you can contact uh, APNIC Help Desk, and there's a uh, online chat facility where you could get a quicker response to find out the status of the transfer. What else? After the transfer, congratulations, now you've got IPv4 addresses. What other things might um, be something you to consider? Um, if you do need reverse delegation, um, usually there's no problem for transfer in the region. It would just 
work once it's set up in a few hours. But with inter IR transfer, sometimes because of the, uh, <clears throat> the time that's approved, processed, and if it's over the weekend, there's a time difference, different time zones. So um, we hope that uh, you understand it might take a little bit longer. So do allow the day or two for that to happen. And we don't see much of these uh, geolocation issues this, uh, at least in the last few months. Uh, but um, from time to time, people may experience the problem. So uh, we suggest that you uh, make an update to the geolocation providers of the address space that you receive, then they might help to solve the problem. So um, this is all for my presentation. Um, so just to quickly summarize, it's good to have an understanding of what a policy is involved and who can be involved in a, tra a transfer process. Always making sure the, the party you are dealing with, they have an active, uh, alleged uh, APNIC account. Uh, um, and do a bit of investigation on the address range that you're receiving and what happened to them. And prepare for your uh, justification information, do a pre-approval, so you can just be sure that once the transaction is happening, you don't actually have to spend more resources and time on it. And always remember to get the source to initiate the transfer process and inform perhaps your billing, uh, your accounts department to organize the payment. And <clears throat> um, that's pretty much it uh, for what you need to be aware. But regardless, if you need more information, uh, I would recommend or feel free to uh, suggest contact our help desk team. We are available Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, UTC plus 10 time. Uh, if you uh, feel like you want to talk to us, you feel free to call or uh, Skype call that is free. If it's convenient for you to do a chat, jump on a chat to chat with our help desk team. Or you can do an email um, to us. We we'll always help you to provide information to guide you through whatever you, that's needed. And that's all for my talk. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, there's a list of URLs here for the reference if you do need them. Thank you. Thank you, George, um, for the information and uh, how Epinic is dealing with the transfer and uh, some useful references. Um, I'm pretty sure you all have some questions in your mind and would like to ask, but uh, let's keep it to yourself for a while. And at the end of, the, uh, of all the presentation, uh, we'll have a Q&A and we can ask all those questions to our panelists. Next, uh, I would like to invite uh, David Huberman from Oracle uh, to share his views. Hi, good morning. David Huberman. I manage IP addresses for Oracle's uh, bare metal cloud division. I'm here to talk to you this morning about buying IP addresses from the perspective of corporate operations. I have been doing this for about four years, and I've made about between 20 and 25 purchases, and sharing some of the information I've learned with you so that it may help you when you are in the market buying IP before addresses. So before you go to the market, you have things you need to think about. You do know how much you want to buy and how long it's going to last you, right? Once you know how much you want, you then have to go and you have to secure your budget. You've got to get your capex. And when you think about your capex, you're asking for money before you know what you can go out and buy and how much you have to pay for it. So you have to get a sense of the purchase price, but you also have to consider you have other fees you're going to have to pay. You have not only some small transaction fees from your regional registry or your national registry, you may have fees to a bank to use as an escrow agent, and you may have to pay fees to a IPv4 address broker or to an exchange. 
In addition to securing the monies you need from your company, you also need to find quality legal counsel. It's very important you approach this not as the buying and selling of a used printer, but it is in fact a merger and acquisition type deal. You will have contracts and legal documents that read and feel much more like you're buying and selling a company or an asset than a printer. The purchase price is key to any deal, but it actually turns out it seems to be more important what are the terms and conditions that the buyer and the seller agree to. The other thing is lawyers are expensive. Quality counsel costs a lot of money. So please ensure you have um, sufficient operating capital to pay. Now, one more step before you go to the market. You've got to keep in mind that you don't always buy and sell just here in APNIC. If you're an APNIC LIR and you need to buy a dress space, you may go buy a dress space from a different region. And please understand that LACNIC and AFRINIC do not have policies which allow space to leave their region. You can still go buy a dress space in those regions, but you're not going to be able to transfer them to APNIC. And all that means is the terms and conditions of the contract and the responsibilities of the seller become much more complicated. If you can buy space here in APNIC or at Aaron or in RIPE, those can, if you choose, move those to APNIC and to your local NIR. Um, as George indicated in his presentation, make sure your account here in APNIC or at your NIR is ready to receive the purchases Make sure you've paid your bills and have pre-approval. So you've got your money. You know how much space you want. So now you have to go find a seller. And I promise you, this is very difficult. It's a very opaque market. Sellers don't talk to sellers. Buyers don't talk to buyers. Buyers don't talk to sellers. Nobody knows who's selling. Nobody knows who's buying. It's a really weird thing. So... We have, and many of them are in this room, middle parties, brokers and exchange operators who work very hard to put buyers and sellers together. Now, the brokers and the exchange operators in this room are my friends. They're good people trying to do good business. But when you approach this deal as a buyer, representing your company, please understand they are not the... Interests of the brokers are not aligned with you. They're interested in making money and making deals happen. You're interested in securing address space of a certain characteristic at a certain price under certain terms. You have to be your own best advocate. You and your corporate management and your legal counsel together must work to achieve the goals of your company in the market. Keep control. You are the engineer. You understand what these IPv4 addresses need to look like, what you're going to do with them. Make sure you are in constant communication with all the parties and don't let somebody else tell you what to do. Now, one of the things I've learned in this market is I'm not a mergers and acquisitions guy. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just an engineer like you. So one of the things I've learned is that accomplishing these deals and making them happen is about people, and it's about our interactions. You as the buyer, me as the seller, perhaps. We have to be able to get along. We have to be able to talk and negotiate and make a deal happen together. It's actually a lot like transit and peering. If you work in that world, or if your colleagues do, this is very much like negotiating that. Sellers will work with you if they like you. If they don't like you, they're going to try and make it difficult. And so there's very, very high value in doing this face-to-face. -face. Um, I'm colored by the fact that I come from a corporate culture which relies heavily on email. We email all around the world to talk to each other. But email is a very ineffective mode of communication 
in my experience, in the IPv4 address market. It's much more important to see somebody, to talk to them face to face, to pick up the phone, or Skype, or anything. But email, it's not a good thing. So you get to the deal and there are three primary factors you want to always keep in mind. The obvious one is price. Are you paying a price you're willing to pay? Uh, but then something you may not think about is the timing. You may buy a slash 16 worth of address space that you, you need for your company. And you may find a seller who has a slash 16. But are you going to take it all at once? Do you need it all at once? Can the seller give it to you all at once? These things aren't always as clear-cut as you may think. Many companies will say, we would love to sell you this slash 16. We agree on this nice low price. Our lawyers have agreed on the terms. But we're using about 10% of it right now. If you give us six months, we'll get out of it. And you can have the rest of that 10%. So will you take 90% of the block now? Or will you take three 18s out of the 16 now and we'll give you the slash 18 in a few months? This is going to happen in the market. So please be prepared for that. I want to talk a little bit about protecting your company as a buyer. There are two types of due diligence you want to do during a deal. The first is technical, and this is where the company is completely relying on you because the lawyers can't do it and management doesn't even know what you're talking about. Is the block you're buying routed? The very first thing you should check because that changes the terms and conditions of the deal. What does RIPE RIS the routing, the route information service, wonderful historic view of routing, say about the block's routing history. Is the block you're buying on any block lists? Typically we're talking about spam. Um, the most important question you have to ask is the seller using the space internally and not routing it. Because if they are using it internally, if they're routing it in their IGP, they may not be able to connect to your services if they happen to be a customer of yours. You also need to do legal due diligence. You're looking for contractual obligations that encumber the space. And you're looking for uh, liens and other legal things that encumber the company from selling the address space and making money off. Unfortunately, you also have to look out for fraud. I've been in this market for four years now, and I believe 30% of this market is fraudulent. And the way I've defined fraud is two different types, willing and un willful and unwitting. Willful fraud, these are just bad people just trying to make a buck by stealing from you. They're intentionally selling space that isn't theirs, they're selling non-registered space. They think we can, there's a block that's not in who is, we can try and sell it to someone, and if they don't check, they'll never know. They'll sell space that they've hijacked from a registry, and they'll sell space that require them to defraud APNIC or defraud one of the other registries to get it. They had to lie. Now there's also unwitting fraud, and this is very important. Because sometimes you have a, a seller who comes to the market to sell you space, and they're acting in good faith. What, what they don't realize is the space they're selling, they actually don't control. They may have divested it, it may be part of a different division in the corporation. And then you have the second bullet point, which is these big corporation problems. And I come across this once in a while, and it's very frustrating, because everyone's innocent. But Part of the company is willing to sell you space and you work hard on the price and the terms and everything comes and it turns out they actually don't have control of the space inside their company. A different department or a different manager does and they're actually represented by a different broker. So one of the questions you want to ask sellers is you control this space, right? Your, your legal department and your executives are going to sign documents if you sell us the space, right? Very important when you're dealing with a big company because miscommunication happens. So, steps to avoid fraud. Rigorously look at your seller. 
Never buy from a company who you don't know. If Apple wants to sell you a dress base, well, we all know who Apple is. Most of us are using their computers, I see. But if a company you've never heard of is selling you a dress space, especially a lot of a dress space, you better be very, very careful and somebody else better know who they are. Um, a small tip, very helpful. Um, you'll sometimes have to put money in escrow into a third party bank um, during the transaction. Um, one of the lessons I've learned is only use a major bank, someone your company already deals with or is willing to deal with to act as an escrow agent. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, thank you for sharing the user perspective. Um, rather than just going up, I say, okay, just talk from here. Um, next, we have Amy Potter from Helco Bank. Hi, my name is Amy Potter, and I head up the IP address brokerage at Hilco Stream Bank. Today, I'm going to walk you through the process of purchasing IP addresses from the perspective of a broker and point out some issues that you should be aware of throughout that process. So the first step when you're looking to purchase IP addresses is to assess your situation. How much space can you qualify with your RIR? is one approach that you can take. So there, there are two ways you can go about this. You can take a short-term purchasing plan where you purchase as much space as you can qualify for with your RIR. Or you can take a longer-term perspective where you purchase as much space as you, can, uh, as you can afford at the moment because you will save money over the long term doing that. Because as you'll see in the next slide, the price for IP addresses is increasing dramatically over time. So if you can acquire as much as possible now you will save money. Uh, so there are two. So when you're doing that, uh, you handle that through doing a futures contract. So you arrange the contract so that you uh, you purchase as much space as possible. You just transfer it over time in tranches as you're able to qualify. Uh, you also need to look at when do you need the space by and make sure that the seller that you're working with is able to deliver it in that time frame. There are some sellers out there that will arrange in futures contracts who still need to do some renumbering. So you need to make sure that you communicate clearly with your seller to make sure that they can meet all of your timing needs. Finally, you need to look at how much to budget. As I mentioned, prices are increasing dramatically. Here we have some recent trends based on some sales that Hilco Stream Bank has done a, over the past couple of years and the, some initial uh, information about some initial sales that have closed uh, Q1 of this year. As you can see, prices are getting more and more expensive, so it is quite advantageous to lock up as much space as you foresee needing ever or in the next several years just to make sure that you don't end up paying any more than you need to. Um, as David mentioned, diligence in the space is incredibly important. You need to look at the address space itself, check out blacklist, and make sure that you don't agree to purchase the space and follow through the sale until you have uh, checked out the space to make sure that it will meet your needs. You also need to check out the seller to make sure that they are, one, able to deliver you the space that they say that they're able to give you. It's really important to check out the registration in the regional internet registry where the seller has that space registered and make sure that the company that you're engaging in a contract with is the same company that the space is registered to. There are two main exceptions to that rule, and that is if you are engaging in a contract with, say, the parent company of the uh, organization that the space you're purchasing is registered to. Another exception is if you are dealing with a bankruptcy estate, so you might end up uh, engaging in a contract with a trustee, um, and you'll be able to look at the bankruptcy docket um, and the documents there to make sure that the IP addresses are included in the assets that the trustee has the right to sell. So recently there have been some issues with fraud, as David mentioned. Um, there have been some problems with uh, hijacking of 
registration. Aaron has been doing a really great job in addressing these issues, but there are some organizations that have successfully taken over the uh, Aaron registration, and I believe it's occurred in some other RIRs as well. So one thing that you can do to help avoid ending up in a situation where you are purchasing space that has been fraudulently hijacked is comparing the date at which the address space was registered to the organization you're working with with the date that that company uh, registered as a company with whatever state they uh, or country that they uh, registered with. Um, uh, there are some other red flags that you should keep an eye out for. So occasionally you just see some things that are weird and you should just investigate those. So we've had situations where there have, there's been space that was fraudulently taken. Uh, documents were signed by people that were dead. Uh, there's one situation where it turned out that some, the person that was trying to engage in this fraudulent activity would have purchased the space when he was eight or nine years old. So you need to look into any sort of red flags that pop up and be really cautious about it because, as David mentioned, there is quite a bit of fraud going on. Um, you also really want to make sure that you are structuring your contract to make sure that you're protecting your organization from these kinds of risks. Escrow is super important to work with. Like, put your money into an escrow account. Don't send your payment over to the seller until you are able to take over control of the address space in the registry that you need it in. Uh, so here are some just general tips for the purchase and transfer process. You, as I mentioned, you want to plan as far into the future as possible because you will save quite a bit of money doing that. Um, also, applying for pre-approval is great. It will speed up the entire purchase process. Make sure that you do go through and do your diligence and make sure that you're comfortable with the space before you agree to purchase it. And also make sure that you structure your contracts, as I mentioned, uh, in order to minimize the risks that your organization will face. And finally, pay attention to your transfer request with your RIR. This seems like a really simple and silly thing, but a lot of deals end up taking much longer than they need to just because somebody wasn't checking their APNIC account or their Aaron account as diligently as they should have and it added an extra week or two to the process. So really make sure that you're diligent about following through with your transfer requests. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for uh, giving us a... Uh, Peter at the doors of history. So, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Amy. I'm going to try to take it in a different direction than what you should do today and try to give you some thoughts. Um, first of all, you have a primary source supply, which is APNIC. They're here in the room, and this is their meeting. They were given quite a bit of space directly by IANA in three different methods. Uh, I know there's some people here that are probably with AP Nick that are making sure this is correct, if we're wrong, which is probable. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, we think basically the IANA has given to AP Nick about 780 million numbers. They still hold those. They're your primary source of supply. If you're an AP Nick member, that's where you get your supply every year. You renew it, it's yours. This is not rocket science. The question is, what do you do if you need additional space? Hence, the transfer market comes about. We've looked at it from a different place. The secondary source supply is termed a legacy. And if you go look at the early registrations between 1983 to 1987, there was a lot of space given out, and I'll explain why. But let's go through the numbers. It's about 1.4 billion numbers over a period of years. And I mean that is a lot of space. Especially if you look at the Class A's, it's almost as many Class A's as APNIC got. Yes, there's a caveat that the DOD of the United States got 13 slash 8. But even if you look at the total space, it's over a billion numbers that was given out. And the shocking part is a vast majority is not being used. So how much unused space is in this pool? And that's where we want to kind of get into. So no, I, I know there's a lot of smart guys in the room and women who are going to tell me there's no way of knowing. They're absolutely right. We don't know. 
but we've now talked of several hundred holders of Class B space, hundreds. And I'm going to first go with the Class A's. They've been picked over clean, and actually, David, I'm pointing at you behind you. You know this better than anyone. Those space have been picked over. There's some other people in the room who know this. There isn't a lot of unused space available for sale in the Class A's. If you're looking in that direction, you're a very brave person. But the Class B's is where there is an immense amount of unused space. And when we did our research, we believe about 8,000 slash 16's are currently not in use. But then the next problem began is there isn't one company that holds them all. We estimate about 6,140 entities hold that space. And let's talk about why. You have to go back to the 1990s, the very early days of this project, the internet project. There was no CIDR, there was no private address space, no NAT. There was no business ISPs until the mid-90s. And what was happening was is companies had to get on the internet themselves. They had to say, if you're a pharmaceutical company, if you're a library or a research company, or if you're just a paper mill or a paving company, and you wanted to get on the internet, you went and had a land land manager go and get, oh, there was Frame Relay or an E1, T1 or ISDN, and they would stick a box on the end of it, and they needed space, and they'd fill out a form, and if they had just more than 240 uh, hosts total, they would get moved and bumped up to a B, you know, the slash 16s. And... Actually, there's Leslie Noble here who worked at the Internet Project and knew it well. And uh, she was very aware that you just filled out a form, you got it. And it wasn't because they were trying to hold it back. The goal was to give out as much space as they could to make it a success. So these were not Internet companies getting space. These were companies that just need to be online. So what does this mean to the market, though? We have a room here full of potential buyers or people that work at registries. There is no such thing anywhere in the world of a room full of sellers. Most don't know they have them because thousands of these companies, and I mean thousands, have one single B. It's all they got, slash 16. They renumbered out of them. They now have business ISPs. The guy that got it or the woman that got it and Landwind Manager in 1989 or 1993 has retired. And with that, the knowledge they even filled out the form. They were free, so they're not thought of as an asset. They're not listed anywhere on their balance sheet. There's no one up in the C-suite that knows. And when you contact them, they don't believe you because this is a language they don't understand. So there are thousands of these entities out in the world that don't know they have them. And I know it seems almost unimaginable that when you would contact them and say, would you like to list your rights? They go, what are you talking about? And they typically hang up the phone because it sounds too good to be true. So what we should talk about, though, is these blocks have something unique for everyone in this room. They have attributes that people want. They're unused. They're not in BGP. They're not being used internally because no one knows they exist. They're not in reverse DNS. They're not in, they have no host names attached. Their sender base score, a plug for Cisco, is neutral or none. They're not in anything except for sometimes there are in the real time black hole list because there are some people that pay attention to these and they use them for what they want and move on. But most real-time black hole list people now are actually working with us and saying, oh, so this is actually needs to be cleaned and we pull it out, we put it in someone's name. Mergers and acquisitions was the second problem here. Most of these are in names of entities that don't exist anymore. And we have lots of friends in the registry world who we work with often on building chains of custody for this. We treat it as if it's an asset that needs to be listed in the proper name. So if you're wondering, is there a, a, a lot of space out there? There is. But the problem is they don't know they have them. So there is a secondary source supply. We've been working on it for seven years now. 
But you have to understand and be patient that there's not a single seller with lots of space. There's multiple sellers with the exact same size. And that's our contribution. This discussion is, as you navigate through this, know that your seller is most likely not going to be technical and no one there actually knows what they're doing. To them, this is a one and done proposition. They sell it and they're, they just close it off. So you as the buyer will know a lot more than the seller because the seller is going to have no idea what they're doing. None. But that's okay. I mean, I've got a room full of people here that I've worked with over the last couple of years, and they will tell you that they just move it as a registration update, and that's pretty much it. So... All right, thank you, Peter. Well, uh, let's open the floor for question and answer um, by me asking the first question because I don't see anybody getting up. Hey, George, um, as Peter said, we have a lot of digging to do in history. So since the last slash eight policy uh, not applicable in, in the EPINIC region, have you seen or the APNIC has seen any um, legacy space being registered in APNIC just for the sole purpose of transferring it to somewhere else or within APNIC? I don't have a specific case now with me, but we do. We don't do a. We we do process historical uh, what we call historical address space claim, and. Uh, it can be claimed under a specific uh, 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 claim policy, um, but I don't have actual uh, the number with me that actually been claimed and up right after that been transferred. Uh, but we do process probably I would say a handful of them a year. Uh, there's a, not a lot for the last probably year or two, but probably back five six years back uh, there were a lot more that we processed. Right. So, um, go ahead. Hi, uh, Mike Burns, IP Trading. I just wanted to say we have handled a couple of cases like that where historical resource holders uh, come to AP NIC um, looking to transfer their addresses. And AP NIC will allow them to become a sort of temporary member, sign an agreement with them just for the purposes of vetting them as the seller and then allowing them to. So it does work. Um, can I just add something? Uh, historical address space uh, claim works is that the, the holder uh, of those address space, once claim, can sign up uh, a non-member account. Uh, and that really means is they have this um, contractual or agreement with APNIC and they pay a different fee to what the normal members would pay basically uh, is to help them to have the address space to be uh, registered, have the correct detail registered in the WHOIS database, and also um, if they are still using the space, then they, they will be able to do, um, say, reverse delegation and so on. So they would have to hold an account with APNI once the address space is claimed. All right. Yep. And then another question on that uh, to the panel is, uh, who should be doing the digging? Is it the responsibility of IANA, RIR, or it is just, it's there, whoever wants to buy or sell it, just go find it out, like the way uh, AddressX is doing it. So whose responsibility is? Or we should, should just forget about it. It's, it's, uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, it, there are like 8,000 or something slash 16 available, still available and used. We just forget about it and move on, or? Mm -hmm. Um, somebody has to do something about it. Actually, we didn't even talk about the Class Cs. There's about 39,000 Class Cs that were legacy, and those are just, its nickname is Swamp Space. So, yeah, we actually do it because there's a financial incentive, but uh, RERs, and I've talked to every single one of them, except for, I guess, Afrinec about this, because they don't really have much, but I could even ask some of them to ch chime in, um, their requirement, they, they don't really have the resources to do this, and it's an immense amount of work to track it down. So instead, they're more on the reception side 
that when the seller brings a chain of custody, they then review it, more of a title office requirement than actually the outreach. So I, I don't know if there's a responsibility shared there, but there's definitely a role that the RIR has in ensuring that there is proper documentation. I'm going to turn your question around just a little bit, Aftab. The only responsibility we have as a community, whether we work at the RIRs, whether we're an operator or anyone else, our only responsibility is to move to IPv6 because this is an imperative. What will happen is while we, are, while we move across that runway to the promised land, there are market forces which naturally take on this responsibility. Prices are rising. You can't change that. There are less and less address spaces available for operators who need IPv4 to get. As prices rise, more, there's more and more pressure on these resources that we're discussing to come out of the woodwork and see. The RIRs can't do it. It's much, as Peter indicates, it's much too big a job. It's way too resource intensive. And as he's noted, most of the time they just hang up on you anyway because it's too good to be true or they think you're selling something, you know? So our responsibility is to move to IPv6. That until then, we buy and sell IPv4 as best we can and keep committing resources to V6. Well, I've, I would be the person uh, to see IPv6 everywhere. I've been um, evangelizing, training, and saying this, and I've lost a lot of hairs since then. But anyway. So, <laughs> just question, just one more question. Um, so, the Oracle Cloud Services, do you provide IPv6? We uh, <laughs> do not today, but we will tomorrow. We just opened for business in October. So, we're still working on the basics. Oh, that's the good news. That's the good news. Still, we have something in the future coming up. But uh, I'll insert something here. The IPv6 isn't going to change the demand for IPv4. Many of the biggest buyers do have both platforms. It'll probably be technical changes such as carry grade NAT versus anything else. I mean, we forget that NAT itself, 1918, uh, RFC 1918, was the greatest change along with CIDR in the demand requirements. So uh, there will be technical forces that will affect the deployment of, of V4 as much as an alternative uh, protocol. Uh, so I, I think what will drive the prices down or make the market disappear will be technical changes, not uh, a conversion. And, and so if you're probably wondering, how do we see this market playing out? As long as there's not a technology solution or a protocol change, there'll be a demand for this market but we don't bet on it being here forever. And so we tell people, if you're selling and you're holding and you want to hold for $100 a number, which some people do, we smile and say, thank you very much. We're not going to change your mind. We move to somewhere else because it's just not realistic. And speaking about price, I was looking at Amy's presentation um, and you mentioned that uh, people are buying and of course, uh, you are doing the transfer, so you know that it's slash 24, slash 23, and slash 22. And the price is just going up. And it doesn't make any sense. Today, I can register, well, it's not ethical, it's very ethical, but I can register a company in the Apenic region, get a slash 22, keep it with me for two years, still have to pay $4,000 or something Australian, and then just transfer it, and then pay around something the transfer fee of 20%, still cheaper than buying from the open market, which is $10 per IP. It's around $10,000 US. So why people are buying it from the open market and not doing uh, the things which is all already happening in APNIC region for sure? Sure. So part of that issue is different in the Aaron region because we don't have the same policies in place where you can just go and get a slash 22. So a lot of those buyers are in the Aaron region. They need space. A lot of them previously were getting that space from their upstream ISP and then their ISP either came back to them and said, sorry, you can't have the space at all anymore or I'm going to charge you an insane amount for it. 
And so it actually makes more sense for them financially to purchase that space and receive it within the Aaron region. It is slightly different in a PNIC because you do have the, uh, you, you can still go and get a slash 22, but in other regions, it makes a lot of sense for a lot of companies um, and users to get those small blocks. Okay, so the idea which I just pitched, uh, uh, we, in, in a, an hour's time, we will be discussing it not to have this idea anymore and the proposal is already in place so they won't be able to transfer the last slash eight address space at all. So that's why I pitched it anyway. Yeah, we, we deal with larger enterprises. So the largest or the smallest space we see transfer is a slash 20 in our marketplace. So we don't act as brokers. We're a marketplace. And well, there are companies here in this room that have worked with us. We don't call you. We don't bother with that. We give you access credentials. You log on. And if you need additional space, you buy it through a marketplace. Well, the smallest we have listed is slash 20s because most of the enterprises need multiples of 16. So it's a different methodology. The, the companies looking for a slash 24, 23, or 22, we tell them go to the RAR and get additional space. We don't, we don't even look at that. That's not something that we'd even consider to be an appropriate use of our time or our resources or theirs. But that said, really the large entities are the ones who are charging or buying up as much space as they can. So maybe I'll turn a question around to this, is why the price is rising? Because certain companies are saying, I have to have that space. And it's a rounding error. If you look at how much they're buying, it's because it powers their, their multiple billion dollar investments. So they're not really driven by price as much as they say they are. They're into getting access to additional space. So I'll add one other thought to that because this has come up a lot. The price differential is not big enough yet for the buyers to inside a large organization to go up the organizational infrastructure and say, hey, let's set up an entity out of region and get free space or cheaper space in another region and then make it available to our uh, infrastructure so that's it I, I think it's people in this room and people in this audience generally are quite sophisticated about how the, the rules work and it's easy they have a peer group they can talk to and say how do you do that um, but the buyers for the small blocks are not uh, typically that focused on uh, RIR rules especially as they relate to last slash eight policies in regions where you can still get a free slash 20 or a, a low cost slash 22. Um, and so it's really an information mechanism, an information shortcoming on behalf of the entire community that these people are not aware of that option. Thank you. Hi, uh, Alain Durand from ICANN, but speaking on my own behalf, certainly not on the behalf of my employer, uh, current past or futures. Um, I mean, you talk about private contracts. And I've heard a couple of times people saying people want to buy more than what they can justify in the IR. So first off, I will notice that seems to be a problem that the policies in transfers, you know, seems to be at odds with the desire from buyers to buy more things. But even leaving that aside, first, question will be, could you give us a sense of what is the percentage of address space or the amount of address space that is locked in into those future contracts? That's the number one question. And the second question is more, when you have those future contracts and a lot of space is locked in there, and as Peter said, most of the A's are gone, and I suppose that a number of them are under those contracts. Um, it seems to me that there's a temptation to create a secondary market, a deriv mar derivative market of all those option contracts. And is this happening? And if I want to buy something on this derivative market, how am I going to know that this is actually a real contract and not a fake contract? Because we have seen a lot of abuse already in people trying to sell things that they don't have of transfers. If we're talking about derivative market of future contracts, it's going to be even worse. So I would like to get your thoughts on that.
Based, I'm going to repeat what I believe the question is, is that for the large blocks, the slash eights, a lot of those are still in their original holders' names, yet they've been spoken for, as I will use the word, a euphemism. The question is, is and I can give my 30-second experiences, which is, these are really large, large buyers and really, really large sellers. And as David mentioned, they actually sit down physically in a room and meet with each other. So if you're looking at why we said the Class A space has been picked over, but it hasn't reflected in the registries, is because these are direct relationships between, well, look at the slash eight holder names that are in the IANA registry. These are rather large entities that got them in the early days still. And the companies that bought this space that did so, as he called an option contract. Now, these are, these are contracts of transfer. They just have not been reflected in the registries yet. So I, I will leave, David, if you don't mind, whatever you're willing to share, how you looked at verifying the seller had the rights and how the seller may have put together an agreement in a form that you would see as appropriate. So, Elaine, at the big end of the market, you have to understand a corporation does not put out 200, 300, 400, 500 million dollars U.S. in capital if they can't turn that into money. And they're not going to turn that into money by arbitraging in the secondary or tertiary market. They make money off of that by investing it into their product which then sells a heck of a lot more money than that. So it's buy and hold. Thank you. And it's buy and hold for a number of reasons. Risk. You don't want to risk that you can't get to IPv6 in time where more than 50% of your customers connect to you over IPv6 before you run out of IPv4 and the market runs out of IPv4. So risk management is gigantic. You can't put billions of dollars in product at risk over two or three hundred million dollars in V4 address space. Secondly, it's about price. I have purchased slash eights at very low prices because they were available. And I convinced the company, spend a hundred or hundred and fifty million dollars now or spend a billion dollars in three years. Well, it's a no-brainer. As far as if you want to operate in the secondary market and you're really concerned about the genuineness, the, the, the realness of this contract, well, that's a real concern. And that's interesting to think about. And that's where I go, where I harp on what I said in my presentation is the most valuable thing in this whole process is your legal counsel. You've got to rely on exceptionally approached Due diligence. Trust nobody. Verify everything. I think what you ask is really interesting because I see in 2018 and I see in 2019 and beyond that secondary markets are going to be incredibly important, especially for middle-sized players. And it's a scary place. Because it might be 30% of the market, in my experience, is fraudulent today. In a secondary market, I bet you that number is higher. So it's a really interesting question. Thank you. All right. So um, another question I have for um, George. Uh, you put it up on your slides. Is, uh, you do Napenik and every RIR, the add and write. They all have uh, certain policies uh, to to make sure that the transfers are legitimate or everything. Why do you ask people for the 24 months uh, deployment plan? Is it an operational procedure? Because there's no such policy for that. Uh, it, for the 24 months is for the transfers. That it, and so on that basis, how many transfers have been denied? Or ever you have denied any transfer on any basis? Oh, related quickly. I don't have the stats on exactly every single reason for every single reject, uh, but I think we share, uh, Guangliang shared some uh, information earlier. 
on the rejection. Uh, yes, Guang Liang from APNIC. Uh, yeah, we, we don't really have a case completely reject a transfer due to the recipient couldn't provide justification to demonstrate the lead. But from time to time, we do have reject some transfer case due to the diligence check for the source. It's not for the recipient because we need to check the source have the right to transfer. If we think it's not um, comply with the APLIC policy, we may deny some of the transfer. It's because the source, it's not, for, not because the recipient. Okay, so just, just for my understanding, the only, the only uh, um, you are only verifying and making sure that the source is legitimate and the resource is uh, legitimately, uh, resource the, is the owner of the uh, resources they are trying to sell. That's it. And if you have denied anything in the past, and it's, it is because of the source was not, uh, was not able to verify themselves. Uh, now, for example, uh, a new APNIC member come to APNIC, they ask for selection D2, right? They, they say they need it for, for the 12th month uh, deployment. But in the next day, they come to APNIC and say, okay, I got it, I want to sell it now. I transfer to another company. And the APNIC postmaster will say, you just tell me yesterday, you need the selection 22 for your lead wall for the last 12th month. But Next day, you tell me you don't need it anymore. And this kind of say story, we say no. Okay, thank you. Uh, you I just want to add at the earlier that your question about the 24 months, and I didn't have the mic on, it is actually written in the policy. It's not the procedure. In, in the transfer the plan, policy. Yes. In the transfer yeah. policy, yes. So, so if I can inject one thing, there is one hole in the policy world, and I know some friends of mine here from RIPE NCC will... will probably cringe at this, there is a hole in the process, and that is if you wish to acquire legacy space that is listed as legacy in the ripe registry, you can, without having to go through any of the policy process, receive a ripe legacy transfer from a ripe legacy holder to your account in ripe, not as an LAR, but you set up your own account, and you can receive as much legacy space as you want that's held in ripe and there is no needs assessment there's no statement of it and more importantly it's not even listed anywhere in their statistics page so when you look at the the transfer statistics for APNIC or at Aaron or at ripe all of them are for what is under contract and is approved ripe NCC legacy transfers are not listed they are not covered by policy, and there is no needs assessment. So many APNIC members have also come through us and received transfers of RIPE NCC legacy space and keep it in the RIPE NCC registry and do not ever go through a needs assessment. It is just a hole in the system that has been exploited, but it makes it so a lot of companies have acquired a the ripe NCC legacy space is the most sought after transfer market right now. I'm pretty sure somebody from Ryan's NCC. Uh, I see him running in. to the mic, and I was coming expecting in. that would be the case. Uh, good morning, Andrea Trima, ripe NCC. I just want to add one point here that this is not a hole in the policy or it is not a loophole. Um, this is part of the policy. There is a legacy policy in place in the RIPE region, um, and this has been discussed. And so this has been a conscious decision by the people who, who made the policy to give the possibility to legacy holders to either register their resources uh, with an RER under a contractual relationship, but also to keep it out of the contractual relationship. Okay, so it's... It's by the community, for the community, so there's no hole, there is no... But the net result is still the same, there's no needs assessment. Well, then it's up to the community to decide if they think it's, uh, they, have, they have some problem, they can fix it, and we, are, we, we have to fix our problems in the next room in 30 minutes, so 
let's see how it goes. Anyway, so um, just moving forward, um, one question to the panel. How long it will take to get rid of this mess? Sorry, I'm just wearing an IPv6 evangelist has. Yeah, no. So I used to work for Microsoft, and we put quite a little, quite a bit of time and money into this question. And what we came up with, which no secret, and I'm happy to share, is we believe that in 2021, roughly five years, four to five years, is when we'll hit this inflection point where about 50% of the world's end users can bring an IPv6 connection, an IPv6 address to a connection. Now, that was the best guess at the time. This was about two years ago. Um, the math hasn't, act I looked at it just a few months ago, the math hasn't changed too much, but it's just a guess. It's, it's, it's an educated guess. Um, it's a couple of years, though, and it, it's kind of scary because as a buyer who's very active in the market, I look at the market and I don't see a whole lot of supply that's going to get us to 2021 or wherever that number winds up being if the number is wrong. So our only requirement is to get to up. Amy, would you like to add something that how many years you have to shut down your business? So I tend to think of the market in three sort of tranches. I think of it as the largest block, so say slash 15, slash 14s and larger. Then there's the mid-size where it's, you know, in and around slash 16s. And then you get the small blocks slash 20s and below. I think that the market is going to start disappearing from the top down because there are large, well-funded organizations acquiring as much space as they can as an insurance policy to make sure they are set up for the future. It's the really small end users that don't have that level of preparation going on and aren't spending the same amount of money with their purchases, so it's not as huge of a deal for them that they're spending $5,000 as opposed to you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think those guys are gonna be around for a long time. Also, from my experience in working with them, they don't necessarily have engineers that are trained in V6. There are all sorts of issues that the small guys are facing, and I think that the market's still gonna exist for, I'd guess, 10 years with the really small blocks. Yeah, so um, as um, Peter mentioned, that they are still uh, 8,000 slash 16 or something. And, uh, but Ellen said that probably some of them are uh, tied up with the future contracts. But there are 39,000 something slash 24 or something. So it's, just, so it's gonna take 10 years. Long time. I, well, I, won't be. I, I want to inject, it's not just the buyers in this room now that are buying. There's a new set of buyers, and it's an interesting conundrum that people need to be aware of, is large corporations are now stepping in to buy space because they want to make it theirs. They want to renumber once out of their network provider, and then they hold their own space. And what they're hoping to do then is, is treat the networks as pipes. And if they don't get what they're looking for, and so we've seen a new rash of buyers that are one and done, they come in and they buy a slash 17 or an 18 or a 16. They're very large corporations, but they are not really in the internet business. And they buy a block and they say, we're going to keep this for years because we don't believe V6 is coming, but we do want to make our network operators subordinate to our numbers instead of getting their numbers from the network operator. So that's something which they should, people should be paying attention to because some smart people in these large corporations are not betting on a conversion. They're betting on the opposite. Martin, uh, Martin Levy, Cloudflare. I want to bring, if I can, um, I want to ask a set of questions, some of which are obvious, but I want to sort of bring things down to earth. For those people that don't spend their time reading all of the policy email lists from the five RIRs. Um, and I don't recommend doing that, quite frankly. Um, it, it's, read the cliff notes. Um, for the five RIRs that have different transfer policies and for the brokers that are moving blocks around, for the audience here, the predominantly AP NIC, uh, Asia Pacific audience, simple question, are IP addresses leaving the region, or are they coming into the region? And then the same for the other regions. Where, 
where is the big picture movement here? Is stuff moving here, there? And I just would like to ask that sort of very general question um, so that it, we get an answer that's relative, relevant sorry, to this, uh, this region and this aud audience. Thank you. I'll take my, I'll sit down. I'll, I'll throw just back what I said earlier. You'll see neither. You'll see uh, eight PNIC members acquiring space in the ripe region and not bringing it in or whatever. They're buying ripe registered blocks and keeping them in the ripe registry and not bring him in or out. Right. I apologize. I meant to say comma and where are the end users and therefore, so to speak, where are the announcements? Good but, point. But, it, but it, where is the, where's the economics, so to speak, flowing it, on top of the register? It's neither transferring in or out mostly. It's that they have learned that they can acquire space and keep it in another registry and just keep it there. So it's kind of neither. I, we don't see a net inflow or an outflow uh, and George, you're probably not seeing as much activity from certain companies. They're buying space in the ripe region and keeping it in the ripe region, and it doesn't appear in their APNIC account at all. Uh, last, um, just want to add, last year I was part of the same uh, discussion panel um, in uh, Auckland, and uh, um, somebody, uh, I don't remember who did that, but somebody uh, uh, gave the stats, and APNIC is the biggest importer of IP addresses. So uh, that was last year. I'm not sure what is the case right now, and I'm pretty sure it hasn't changed, and we are still the biggest importer. Anyone would like to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So the Aaron region received the largest supply of V4 addresses historically, and you do, while there are some specific trends going on in the ripe region, there still are a significant number of inter RIR transfers going from the Aaron region into both RIPE and AP NIC just because there's more space to be purchased in the Aaron region. Yeah, just because there is a lot of legacy space available in the Aaron region, they are, they are just exporting it, and who's importing it? It's AP NIC and probably some to our, uh, RIPE as well. That's the case? What do yeah, you think? I think from my perspective, watching the market over the last four years, uh, the AP NIC region, the companies and the end users in this region are by far the biggest market segment of buyers. Um, and actually, if we could see all the numbers, if they weren't quite as opaque, I think the number would be huge. I think it would be a, a large plurality of addresses go to AP NIC end users um, from a routing and, and use perspective. Um, there are also interesting rules in different countries. Um, Brazil and China are two examples I know of where you really cannot originate route announcements of address space in that region unless you've registered those blocks in that NIR. So in addition to Asian, Asia Pacific AP NIC members and users moving space into the AP NIC region, there's also a large segment of multinational companies who move space into the AP NIC region to move them into CN NIC because we can't get China Telecom or China Unicom to route the address space unless it's actually registered in CN NIC who is. And that actually, it's a statistically significant amount of address space as China is a very large market. Okay, and nothing to take away from any other RIR. We are the biggest population in the world, so. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah. so yeah, that's pretty obvious, right? So that's why they're, we are the biggest importers. Perfect. So, do we have any other questions? And I would just like to end with the last one. Uh, do we have to come back here again in the next app record to have the same discussion? Or do you see any, any change happening in next one year? We saw some statistics in the IPv6 uh, uh, panel and India from nowhere came back in Asia Pacific and it is on the top just because of one operator. So it can change overnight. So do you see any reason that we have to be here again next year or no? Yes, I think we do. Next year is too soon. I don't think anything really interesting is going to happen in the calendar year 2017 that's going to make this market any less relevant. Um, we're not there yet. So yeah, we have to be here next year. All right. So on that note, 
Thank you so much, everyone. Let's meet next year in Kathmandu. Thank you.